And I'm very glad to contribute to this conference, even if virtually, and I would have loved, of course, to be uh, in Helsinki. And I have to say, I'm also quite relieved to present this paper after Sir Besley's keynote on trust and state capacity, because this is partly what this, mostly this research is about. And so at least now I don't have to convince you uh, that trust matters for building capacity. So the core concern of the research that I'm presenting today, it's really that if trust for government is key to state capacity, and trust is enhanced by government's performances as providers of public goods or security, then the question that we should be asking probably is what happens when third actors, like th 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 third parties, sorry, like the UN, heavily support the government in providing these goods, in developing capacities in a way that ultimately may make it difficult for citizens to distinguish who's been providing and so to attribute in a way uh, the merits of that provision. So what I'm doing here, I'm trying to think a little bit about whether there is a trade-off between building some capacities for the state to be able to better provide for citizens uh, and also in a way undermining what could be another key pillar of, this, of, 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 of state capacity, which is again, uh, trust, and then ultimately this uh, is linked to uh, legitimacy. So more, um, more specifically, the way I think this is linked to the way peacekeeping particularly is done, I think policy-wise we've seen how the practice of peacekeeping has become increasingly entrenched, entrenched with peace building and even state building. So you've seen that since the 90s, I mentioned here a few key documents, but I'm focused particularly on the capstone doctrine where you do see how peacekeeping really is a tool for peace building in the sense that it's the two of them are very much interconnected. And you see this also in how, in, in the things that peacekeeping operations now do on the ground. More specifically, empirically, you see a trend towards broader mandates, longer missions, and even in general, a phased UN presence where you have, for example, peacekeeping missions, then, then develop a more peace building mandate and ultimately are replaced by special political missions, which are purely political tools. They don't have any uh, military component. And so the question is, should the UN be doing this? I mean, is it really a risk that externally led state building uh, can undermine the legitimacy of state, of governments in the eye of uh, populations? And here you can see how, I mean, these are all these are peacekeeping operations uh, after the end of the Cold War. You can see the extent, the, the, the breadth of the mandates that these missions have. And if we were to draw a similar graph for years, before the end of the Cold War, probably you would only be seeing just a few red, orange, and brown dots, but nothing else, which suggests how broad, but also in a way intrusive, uh, contemporary peacekeeping mandates um, are. And so the question is whether this could actually be a problem uh, somewhat for, uh, for governments that uh, can also at the same time benefit from the presence of peacekeepers. So if state building is part in some way of of the general peacekeeping goals, then again, the question is whether in facilitating effective governance, so improving the performances of national governments in providing public goods, but also security to citizens, there could be an attribution problem from the perspective of citizens who, who might not be, who may ultimately be convinced that, 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 that the state is not able to provide for them because they need the presence of the international community of the UN in this specific case. So the general question this research is concerned with is whether missions with strong peace building components, which are then particularly intrusive, can threaten or maybe boost state legitimacy. So I think in principle, it's not entirely clear a priori which would be the direction of our potential effect of peacekeeping operations in regards to uh, trust towards national institutions. Um, and what, what I do here, I try to think about what the UN do, um, what UN does on the ground in relation to three key pillars that have been identified by uh, Rubin, but also been used by other uh, social scientists when thinking about state formation. Uh, so focusing particularly on re rebuilding in the case of post-conflict settings, of course, rebuilding coercion, capital and legitimacy. I think the UN does different things on the ground They try to tackle each of these pillars, but I would like to say a few more things on the, on, on the legitimacy aspect. So when it comes to coercion, you're probably aware that UN does not only generally violence reduction, which seems to be successful, uh, but also does um, disarmament, demobilization, demobilization and reintegration programs, demilitarization, reforming the security sectors, all these things, all these things, the UN seems to be successful at doing them. When it comes to capital, 
the presence of UN missions is also associated with higher, um, uh, with, with larger volumes of, um, of aid flows, implementation of development programs, quick impact projects. And this is true not only at the, we could say the national level or at the macro level, but also at the micro level, you see that peacekeeping operations seems to provide this economic boost uh, even in local communities where you see, uh, for example, um, higher household consumptions in general. When it comes to legitimacy, however, what the UN does, and I think this relates nicely to the previous, um, uh, to the previous, what the previous speakers have been talking about, mostly the UN focuses on elections and democracy. So what they do, they, um, they, they help organizing elections and basically assume that in some way this procedural approach to legitimacy will mean that the government ultimately, because, it's, because the process was a democratic process, um, ultimately is a legitimate government. Um, what I, the, the take that I try to have here is one that focuses particularly, however, on the performance-based approach, the things of legitimacy in terms of what the, what the government does for citizens. Is the government providing for them as, is it, as it's expected to do? And more specifically, when it comes to the relationship between UN and this performance-based legitimacy, we know very little. So we don't know exactly whether um, the UN makes service provision better in countries that host peacekeeping operations. The evidence we have is that this is probably a null effect. Uh, however, we know that public, the provision of public goods reinforces trust, but it's not just the provision itself, but also who's providing these goods. And other research that I've been contacted with, uh, Rob Blair and Anna Smith, suggest that actually bypassing the state rather than engaging with the state can be costly for the legitimacy process. We look particularly at democratization, but I think this nicely translates more generally um, to the case of, um, of, of public goods provision and more generally provision of security and basic needs for citizens. So in, in trying to mobilize, if, if, the, UN, if, if, if the UN is providing um, by in a way replacing the states, I feel empirical implication or observable implications. I would expect the citizens, for example, that have been exposed in some way, so they know that the UN has been doing things for them and for the country in general, for the government. Um, so citizens exposed to UN, in, so in specific deployment areas, would be more likely to trust the government and the police, just because the government and the police as national institution would have benefited from the capacity building that the UN has been doing. But at the same time, this relationship is expected to be moderated or mitigated by factors such as the duration of the deployment, with longer deployment ultimately signaling probably state weakness rather than an expectation that the state is actually building capacity, and also the effectiveness of the deployment itself, because the government consent to the deployment. And so in some way, it's possible to think about how the UN performs having spillovers in how the government is perceived in return. And the way I try to look at that is focusing on a, on a mission that had a particularly strong peace building mandate, was also a pretty long mission, and its own mill was the, that was deployed in Liberia up until 2018. And I matched the location of deployment from the GOPKO data with three ways from the alpha barometer uh, that correspond pretty much to, to the withdrawal phase of the mission. So basically units that or locations or respondents that were exposed to the presence of peacekeepers uh, basically, you don't have new ones that will be treated in the future. So basically, most of the exposure uh, had happened already. <clears throat> and uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Afrobarometer, this is a nationally representative survey based on the 2008 census. That's at least the case for the waves I'm looking at. And here you see the distribution of respondents across counties in Liberia. Um, ultimately, when pulling together these three different waves, I have more than uh, 3,500 reference respondents across the three waves, and I mostly focus on explaining whether they trust particularly two types of institutions, the president and the police. I also include traditional leaders. I won't say much about this in, in the interest of time, but I think this is a, uh, just a juxtaposition that I would like to hear more uh, thought on. And then I look at whether the presence of UNMIL, the duration of the deployment, and the average size of the deployment matters in explaining trustful institutions, and whether, again, the effectiveness of the mission and the perceived support that the citizens have from, that citizens perceive they received from the UN matters for this. I will, I will say this, that unfortunately I, was, I, I wasn't able to, I was initially planning to do an unexpected event uh, design that would allow me to say more about the causal relationships here, but I hope the patterns I'm going to summarize in the next slides um, provide some insightful um, uh, uh, ideas anyway. <clears throat> 
So generally speaking, you can see here president, police, and then judicial leaders. As I said, I'll focus on president and police, particularly in the interest of time. And mostly you see that exposure to peacekeeping operations before the survey was undertaken um, in, is associated with increased trust, to increase the chances of trusting the president and the police. At the same time, however, this seems to be conditional on the length of the deployment. You see that as the deployment gets longer and you move from, for example, six months to 12 months deployment, we see 10 percentage point decrease in trust towards the president, particularly. Also, the performances of the mission seems to affect how governments and the police are perceived, but in opposite way. So when it comes to president, again, which you can think of the case of the president of Liberia, basically that's the government. So it's a presidential setting. So um, ongoing violence in the aftermath of the deployment reduces trust for president, possibly suggesting that the mission has not worked, has not been successful in delivering, and the government had consented to that. And so in a way, this could be the government might be getting the blame um, for that. But you see an increased trust towards police, possibly linked to the fact that now that the UN is not there anymore, but possibly the police is the institution that citizens may perceive they can rely more upon. And finally, also find that citizens that acknowledge that the UN has supported Libya in the past, so throughout the post-conflict phase, are also more likely to trust the government. And I think ultimately what this tells us is that possibly UN peacekeeping is not really undermining the legitimacy of national institutions. However, long deployments may erode trust because they may signal lack of capacity. And also if violence lingers, governments can get the blame. Although when it comes to security forces, they may actually get a confidence boost. I Jessica, would want to can you hear me okay? Into... Uh, yes, can I, yes. Can I, give you, can I give you 30 seconds to wrap up? And then yes, we'll come that's back the last slide. Actually, uh, ended here. So that was the last slide. Thank uh, you. I just conclude that thanks. Then.